joining us this morning. So it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Joao Spania, who's uh, a professor in ECE at UC Santa Barbara. Um, professor Hispania's research is broadly at the intersection of control, game theory, and optimization. So perfect fit for our seminar series uh, this time around. And his work has been recognized with many awards and honors, including but not limited to the National Science Foundation Career Award and the 2009 Roberti Young Research Researcher Prize, as well as uh, the fact that uh, Professor Hispania is a fellow of the International Federation of Automatic Control, so IFAC, and of uh, IEEE. He was also a dis uh, IEEE Distinguished Lecturer from 2007 to 2013. Uh, and today we have the pleasure of hearing about his work on online optimization for output feedback control. So I'll turn it over to you uh, now, Joao. All right, thank you. So let me share my screen. And full screen. Okay, so you see my screen now, right? Yeah. Good. Well, before getting to this business, let me first thank you for inviting me to be here. It's great. Of course, I'd much rather be there, but that's that's how things work these days. So it's still it's still great to be able to talk about this. Uh, I was debating on what topic I was going to talk about, um, and I I actually go to UW. Well, I used to go to the UW with some regularity, and that. Uh, gave talks there. So I wanted to talk about something that I is a little bit less familiar for, regarding my work. So I, I, I chose this topic, which in fact, turns out to be a topic I'm, I've been spending quite a lot of time on this. I'm pretty excited about it. So it's, it's, um, it was a great opportunity to talk about this to sort of a, an audience I hadn't been able to reach uh, before on this particular topic. So it's going to be a talk, uh, as um, Lina was saying, sort of a mix between optimization and control. I, I guess I can go here to have an outline slide. So the idea is to use um, optimization within a control loop. And um, it's in some ways a classical thing. And I'm going to start by talking, talking about something that's very well known, model predictive control. Um, I will then talk about two other topics, uh, which are still applications of, uh, are clearly applications of optimization with a feedback loop. Moving horizon estimation is sort of the uh, state estimation or obs observer problem uh, uh, formulated in optimization um, optimi from it as an optimization. And then I'll talk about integration of this MPC and MHE, and that is work that we've been doing. That's probably going to be at least half of the talk. If you look at this outline, it seems that um, I'll spend a lot more time there. Uh, at least half of the talk I want to spend on the last item here, which is to solve fast, to, to uh, construct fast solvers for real-time control. Um, and it's, I, I think it's a very interesting topic. And what, you, what I'm going to try to convince you there is that problems related to real-time control have particular structures that, as opposed to many other problems that have, uh, that we are is optimization, allow us to use, to, to build solvers that are particularly fast through a combination of, of, of um, ideas, okay? So uh, that's the plan for my talk. The, the first part is mostly related to the work of a PhD student, David Kopp, he, he finished some time ago, all this work on MPC and mixing MPC with MHEs from his thesis. Uh, but then the, the construction of these solvers and, and improving upon these results have been uh, done with several other students uh, and other collaborators. So <clears throat> before getting started with this. I, this is a little bit funny. I'm showing you sort of one of the final videos. Uh, but I wanted to do this to show you sort of the type of problems I'm interested in. So what you see is a, is a simple pursuit evasion game. There's a, a flying vehicle, which I guess it's the blue trajectory. No, it's the green. And there's a, an evader. There's a very simple model. Uh, and what you're seeing here is the green trying to pursue the evader. The evader in the beginning is actually not really evading, it's just moving on a straight line. 
you see that here and then it starts to evade and actually the, the flying vehicle has to do with wind. So I present this presentation, uh, present this result sort of show you the kind of things I'm interested in. So we have here nonlinear dynamics. Nonlinear dynamics here come, come mostly from the, the flying vehicle. There's constraints. One of the things that complicates this problem is that the vehicle has constraints cannot go too slow. Uh, and in fact, as also turning rate constraints, there's an unknown disturbance here, which is the wind. That's the biggest one, although there's also some noise in measurements. And I'm aiming at fairly fast sampling, at the very least 10 hertz, uh, 100, perhaps 1,000 hertz, right? So what that would mean is that I have to generate controls every few milliseconds, right? So if I'm going to make an optimization, everything has to be done in just a few milliseconds. That's the time I have. OK. Um, so let me start with model predictive control. I think many of you, or maybe most of you, uh, may have heard about model predictive control. So let me go. So this is a, it's a feedback loop. We have a process, and we have a controller. It's going to be this MPC controller. Uh, in the classical MPC controller, you have um, some nonlinear system like the one you have there. And uh, what is specific here that I want to emphasize now is that classical MPC is, uh, is, uh, assumes that the state is observable. You know the state, there's no output here. The state is measured. And uh, so that's process dynamics and nonlinear equation with, um, with an input. And you have a criteria. Uh, the criteria is a criteria where I try to find the control sequence not a single control, but the control sequence. It's an optimization that you start at some time t, let's say t is the current time, and you're going to optimize something over an horizon of length capital T. And there's a running cost and a final cost. Um, so basically, if you think this picture tries to show that you had at a certain time, <coughs> you've seen your state trajectory, you apply some input, but at that point, you ask, well, from wherever I find myself now, x of t, and remember I said this is state feedback, so you know where you are, uh, you're going to do planning for uh, the state and the control to minimize some criteria over a, 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 an horizon of length capital T. Um, so you solve this problem, and it's going to give you a sequence of views from now to this capital T should be something sufficiently large. Um, you can think of infinity, although in practice you can never do infinity for numerical optimization, but a, a large time. And then what you do is you apply the first one of the sequence. Uh, and then what happens is that the next instant of time you repeat this. You figure out where that control took you, perhaps exactly to where this equation tells you should go if there's no disturbances, you know exactly where you ended up. But if there's disturbance, you may not end up exactly where you thought. You reply this and you keep doing this. Um, of course, you know, there's two things to keep in mind here. One is why should you keep repeating this? Well, because the idea is that you have a model, but the model is not exact. So you apply a certain control, and where you may end up may not be exactly where you expected. And so the optimization could be a little different. Uh, but the other thing to keep in mind is that um, you keep receding your horizon. So you always plan for, let's say, 10 seconds from the current time. Okay. This type of optimization is very, <clears throat> uh, people like it a lot. It's, it's uh, very popular uh, for a few things. One is that it can handle, I, I didn't really emphasize here, but when you saw this optimization, you could put constraints. You could suddenly put that my U belongs to some set, but you could also put constraints on the state, on the final state, intermediate states, etc. It directly addresses performance, you know, as opposed to a PID controller where you're adjusting these gains K and you have some idea of how these gains will affect your performance. It's not the one-to-one -one match. You can put exactly what you want. Um, and you can, of course, in principle, uh, solve this for nonlinear processes. Your criteria could be very complicated. In fact, there's a there's versions of MPC which are often called 
economic MPC where you you basically put here the pro if you imagine this is uh, this uh, process dynamic is a factory what you put here is a profit in dollars like you just I don't care about set points or anything I just want to maximize profit could be a very complicated function to figure out from the voltage I put in my motors to profit in dollars but in principle could be done uh, of course it's easy to say you know I can put non-linear um, dynamics, complicated costs, uh, you, you eventually will have to solve this optimization. So um, one has to worry about that. Um, but if we were to, to, to forget about that, it really is very, very attractive. Um, a, a few things here to say sort of in the challenges. So first is that the formulation action here requires the state to be measured because the idea is that you always look at the current state and predict from there. We're going to see that that's easy to resolve. Uh, and the other question is how to make sure that you get actually get some sort of stable or bounded behavior out of this. And the complication here comes from the receding horizon part of the optimization. And, and the way how this could work, you could very well run this always optimizing and in fact, get terrible behavior. And there's a there's a story about that. I, I think I've heard it for the first time from Jim Rawlings, one of my colleagues, which is the following. Imagine that I'm trying to grade exams and I have to figure out how many exams I'm going to grade in the next week. And you know, I put some criteria and I make a plan, I'm going to grade the exams next week. And my plan is, well, on the first day I'm going to rest because I'm a little tired. And then I'm just going to grade the exams on the remaining days. Then I implement the first part of my plan, which was on the first day I'm going to rest, I'm not going to grade any exams, and I'm going to redo the optimization again tomorrow. And you can see that if I'm a procrastinator, it's going to be a problem because every day I can re-optimize. I always decide the first day I'm too tired and I'm actually never going to do it. So this business of receding the horizon can in fact lead to terrible behavior, right? So when, once we do this, even though it may seem a great idea, receding horizon can lead to trouble and one has to, even if the optimization doesn't fail, worry about making sure that you actually have convergence, things remain bounded, eventually you achieve your, your objective. So we'll, I'll talk about some of those things, okay. So this is model predictive control in one slide. Um, I told you about this issue that the state may not be accessible. So uh, the standard way in control when you want to control a process and don't have full state measurement, you try to estimate the state. And this is uh, what moving horizon estimator estimation tries to do is one technique to do uh, state estimation. Of course, I, I chose this one here because it's also based on optimization. So the idea is that you have some process dynamics like this one here. So what I've done here to make the problem non-trivial and interesting is I added some disturbance. So you, don't, you cannot predict exactly the next state and there's some measurement noise. And in maximum likelihood estimation or one way, sorry, in <laughs> moving horizon estimation, uh, one way to think about this is you're trying to do sort of numerical maximum likelihood estimation. So you'd go about, you could ask, well, <clears throat> uh, let's consider one possible sequence of disturbances, one possible sequence of noise in the particular initial condition. Let's write the likelihood of those particular initial condition disturbances and noise and try to solve a numerical optimization that maximizes the likelihood subject to the constraints and the constraints are the dynamics and the measurements that they actually got. So if you want to turn this, and so, oh, by, by the way, so let this picture is important. So in, in moving horizon estimation, what you do is I'm at a certain point T and I'm trying to figure out a past initial state and a past state trajectory knowing the measurements y and the measurements I appear here, they in fact will appear as an equality constraint, an equality constraint, sorry. And um, 
I also know which inputs I applied, so that's also known. So the things I do not know are the disturbances and noise. Once I fix some disturbance and noise, then in the initial condition, I'll be able to compute X. So <clears throat> for the case of uh, disturbance and noise that are independent across time, if you want to figure out the likelihood of a sequence, I just have to multiply the, the PDFs uh, over the time interval. So this is a past time interval from T minus L. I'm looking at a, a, a window of measurements of length L. I multiply the PDFs of the noises and the disturbances. If I work in log, uh, I just apply a log to this in log likelihood, then it's going to be instead of a product, it's going to be a sum. So in fact, it's a, a, my criteria here is going to be the sum of the logs of the PDFs. And, you know, uh, if, for example, this were IAD Gaussian, this actually would be something very simple. It's a quadratic cost. Which in fact, is what you mostly see in moving horizon estimation. Um, and it's often also called minimum energy estimation because you could see these quadratic functions as the energy of the noise and the energy of disturbances. And then the measurements and the dynamics appear as constraints. So one way to think about this is that what would be the least amount of noise and disturbances, if you want to think about in terms of energy, or you could also say, what would be the most likely noises and disturbances that could that would be compatible with these dynamics and explain the measurements that I've seen. So this is moving horizon estimation. It's moving horizon because I solve an optimization like this at every time t, looking at measurements that come over a past window of horizons. And so I'm always going to look at capital L, a window of size capital L, which means that I'm going to be, every time I go one, for, one step, step forward in time, I'm going to throw away one measurement that was more than L time steps back. And the idea is that very old measurements don't matter anyway. So this is just as good as um, yeah, sort of the more pure maximum likelihood estimation. By the way, if you were, uh, if the system was linear and everything was Gaussian, um, you'd basically get, uh, um, a, a, this would turn out to give you exactly the same solution as a Kalman filter. Uh, a Kalman filter with just a finer set of measurements, right? Not coming all the way from infinity. We had a time varying, it's not a steady state Kalman filter. Uh, but the nice thing about this, I guess this is what's here, is that um, this approach in principle, if we're, if we um, accept that we can solve any optimization, uh, you know, this is perfectly general. You could put any nonlinear process dynamics. Uh, you could consider any types of um, PDFs or uh, models for your noise. You don't have to consider Gaussian, it could be heavy tail, whatever. Uh, an interesting thing is that, and it's, I, I did put it here, uh, and it could be even more. You can also handle constraints. The interesting thing about constraints in estimation is that when you're solving a control problem like the MPC problem I showed you before, constraints are not good. I mean, they just make the problem more difficult. Meaning, you know, I would love to use a huge control signal, but I can't. So my performance is not going to be as good. In estimation, it's the opposite. The constraints are good because the constraints get rid of possibilities. So if I say that my disturbance is small, in essence, my state, I'm going to get better estimates. Constraints on the state are particularly good. For example, if you are, if your state X contains a concentration, you know that the concentration can never become negative. So it's perfectly fine to in the estimation problem to put a constraint saying that my X or some component of X is positive. And that's just going to make the optimization um, easier to solve. Constraints always help. Okay, so constraints, um, which are very difficult to take into account in something like a Kalman filter. I'll put in a Kalman filter, how do you put the constraint that the state has to be larger than five? Uh, in, in, in this optimization framework, it's, it's straightforward and, and very often results in much better estimates. It does still have some issues when has to worry about convergence. Again, because you are throwing away measurements, although in the context of estimation, the throwing away measurements not too bad because uh, unless you have um, a very unusual process, old measurements are not as useful. Okay, so I want to now 
tell you about something which is uh, a little different, which is how do you go about combining these two things? Uh, the, the way I introduced maximum likelihood estimation was to solve output feedback problems. So that would be a, the picture that you have up here. Uh, I now have a process. I put some disturbance. I have some measurement. This measurement here is supposed to be what is available for control. Um, and this two-step procedure that I'm showing you in this slide is sort of the more obvious way to do things, which is at every point in time, you solve an estimation problem, let's say using moving horizon estimation. So you basically try to figure out what will be the value of the state disturbance and noise that's most compatible with the observations that I got over a past horizon, let's say capital L horizon. It's all this optimization. You get all the state, the initial state disturbance noise, but out of that, you also get an estimate for the current state. It's not a true state, but it's an estimate. If, if you're putting your PDFs, like I was uh, mentioning before, this in fact be sort of a maximum likelihood estimate for the state. Then what you do is you take this to be the true state and just apply moving horizon estimation. So there's a, there's a leap of faith here that you know here that this X set is not the true state. It's just a reasonable estimate, hopefully reasonable estimate of it. But you forget all about that. You say, well, as far as MPC goes, I'm going to assume that this is the true state. And then I solve computer control, et cetera. And this will actually generally work fairly well. At this point, by the way, it is pretty important that this is that you keep doing this receding rise and repeating the, the optimization because this estimate is never going to be quite correct. So most likely when you move one step in time, you're not going to land the state went exactly what you where you where you expect it. But once again, you redo all your estimation, figure out the most likely place, and you redo this. <coughs> So this has inherits a lot of the advantages of MPC and MHE. You know, in principle, uh, you can do this for nonlinear process. You can put constraints in the estimation. You can put constraints on the control, and and uh, and it, it works fairly well. <clears throat> but there's one thing here that led us to try to pursue something different, which is that <clears throat> the separation into two steps means that when you solve the optimization you get one particular estimate. And when you solve this optimization, you know, or you may know whether or not you have a lot of confidence on this estimate or not. Why, what do I mean by this? You're solving this optimization. You're maximizing a function. Imagine that this function is very steep and narrow. Sort of there's like a unique local maxima and you perturb anything around it and the criteria just decreases immensely the likelihood. Well, that's a case where you know that this X set is pretty good. You know, may not be correct, but you have a pretty, by looking at the curvature of the function at the top, you, you can be pretty sure that this is a very good estimate. On the other hand, it may well happen that instead of having a very steep likelihood, you have something that sort of has a plateau at the top. And so you have this maximum, but you perturb the maximum a little bit and it's almost the same likelihood. When you solve this maximization, you know that, or you could know if I, for example, go and compute, let's forget about the constraint, the imagine it's unconstrained. If I just compute to the Hessian of this matrix, I can very well know if this is a very flat minimum or not. But all I pass to MPC is the estimate. So the MPC is going to produce exactly the same control whether or not I am incredibly sure about this except or not. There should be a way, and that's what we're trying to overcome with the approach that I'm going to tell in a moment, to take that into account. And conceivably, if you, this, if you have not, if you don't have a lot of uncertainty in this estimate, perhaps you want to choose a different sequence of views that much that is much more conservative. Okay. So one way to do that is to turn these two separate optimizations into a single optimization. And that's what I'm showing you in this slide. So it's a little, there's lots of elements here that I've shown you before. Um, 
so first is a min max instead of just a minimization. Minimization over U, maximization over disturbance. If you forget about maximization and the color terms here, you'd get the MPC problem. I want to minimize, I want to find a sequence of control U's that minimizes some criteria over the future from S to S plus capital T, so a future horizon of length capital T. But then one way to think about is that suppose now I'm trying to figure out if a particular U is good. So I set for the particular sequence of U's. You could then ask, well, for that sequence of U's, how bad could things get if I was now allowed to choose some initial condition disturbance and noise is that instead of trying to make this small, try to make this large. Now, if you just did that, if you just sort of mean u max x d and this, you typically get something very conservative. Because of course, a simple way to mess this all up is to choose like huge disturbances and noise. Right? You basically could probably make this infinity just by or, or initial condition. So then the trick is to add a penalty term that penalizes from the perspective of this max unlikely disturbances and noise. So this max here has to be careful because if you choose a very D's, N's, or X, the, these penalty terms, which you remember, so that this is what was existing in the MHE, it penalizes very unlikely disturbance and noise. So if you go back to the example I was telling you a moment ago, where uh, imagine that the, the moving horizon estimation was trying to maximize the likelihood and the likelihood was very, very steep. What that's going to be is that to move away from the estimate, you're going to pay a huge price here, right? So this maximization is pretty much stuck at the maximum likelihood ND and is unable to sort of move away from that to trying to make this cost worse. On the other hand, if if it's very flat, what's going to happen is that there's going to be lots of freedom for the maximization to choose the initial condition um, disturbance and noise. And at that point, it, it, it has the potential to increase this by very much. And now you have, when you choose the, the U, you have to be careful in choosing U's that could allow the disturbance and noise to make this very bad, okay? So what's happening here is we don't separate this into two optimizations. And we provide the minimizer you uh, visibility into how certain you are about your state estimate. And that's the key difference here. Well, um, a, few, a few comments here. First, from a computational perspective, this is worse. Uh, almost in almost any optimization, replacing two small optimizations by a large optimization is computationally worse. Right, so we are paying a price here. And in fact, if this approach that I was showing you before a separating leads to good results, this is typically the first thing you try, all right? <clears throat> now, there are some advantages to do, uh, to combine this, assuming that we don't get something that's computationally crazy. And in fact, and in fact we're not going to. Uh, once is what I talked about before, by doing this, you basically pro protect the feedback against sort of potentially optimistic state estimates. The feedback is going to be, control signals are going to be chosen, taking into account how much information you have about the current state of the system. It turns out also that it is easier to develop a stability theory for this particular setup. And in fact, these two things go together because the point is that you, because you're preparing yourself for the worst disturbances and noise, you know that the real disturbance and noise cannot be much worse than that. And so in fact, the, the stability proof is built upon that. I'm, I'm not going to do the stability proof here. Now, um, something that one has to be a little careful is that is this too conservative or not? And when you look at this, you can see that once you have good data, and you, the, the maximum, uh, the, the moving horizon estimation will give you a good estimate. This is not conservative. This almost generates into this situation. But typically, while you still don't have good data, often in the beginning, um, when you are doing the first steps of uh, first time steps, you have not yet gathered enough information. It can be 
it can be conservative, uh, but in some ways it, it needs to be conservative because it can't be conservative because you just don't have data. You have to, to compute a U basically with no data. Okay. I am not going to uh, do any sort of stability proof here, but I wanted to show you. <laughs> I'm not showing you, I don't think I actually have a slide of results. So I don't show you the assumptions because they are useful. Um, and I am going to use them later on when we start talking about um, um, numerical algorithms. So you basically need three assumptions to make sure that when you do this in a iterative fashion, you're going to get bounded trajectories. Uh, two of them are more or less obvious. There has to be a controllability. You, you have to be able to, through you, make sure that you can take X to uh, good places of the state space, good in terms of these criteria. Uh, there has to be an observability assumption because if there's no observability, then you'd not be able to use Y to get good behavior of X. This uh, words controllability, observability, and quotation marks for the following reason. If this was a linear system, and the, well, if this was a linear system, this would just be standard controllability observability. There'll be not much to say, we all know about that. With one caveat is that even when we're talking about discrete time, observability in discrete time, with a single output, you'll not be able typically to reconstruct the state. In discrete time, you'd least typically need as many outputs <clears throat> as the number of states. In our problem, this comes in the term, in terms of this horizon L. So basically to be able to get enough information from a sequence of I's to figure out what X is, you typically have to observe um, a given horizon of Y's. And these conditions typically come, the observability is, L is sufficiently large so that this happens. So that's one comment. The other comment that one says that uh, when things are non-linear, there aren't single definitions, well, except definitions for controllability and observability for non-linear systems. And in fact, the one that we use is a little different than the standard ones. If you want to think about it, the controllability notion basically has to say that you, has sufficient power to make C small, a summation over C small. It's not really about taking the state for wherever you want, because that may not be needed. But you have enough power in you to cause this summation to be small. Um, and the observability has to do with L is sufficiently large, and this map G is sufficiently well behaved that you are able to reconstruct X for small disturbances and noise. Okay, all this has to be parsed into sort of more or less complicated conditions, which I'm not going to bother to do here. There is one more assumption that's needed, and that's the one that is more unexpected, because of course, controllability and observability assumptions, controllability is needed for general MPC, and observability is needed for general MHE, moving around an estimation. But the other assumption that we need is that the minimization uh, of the mean over u max over disturbance initial condition has to commute. So the mean max is to be equal to the max mean. Now, <clears throat> if my criterion, the criteria is this whole thing here, if it was convex on the minimizer and concave on the maximizer, this is well known sufficient condition for that to happen. For linear systems and quadratic costs, it turns out that this holds provided two things happen. One is that you have observability, although observability you need it anyway. But you also need to make sure that these penalties here are large. You have to choose them sufficiently large. Uh, but you can show that in that case, this is, system is observable. For unfortunately, for nonlinear systems, there is no simple way to just look at some nonlinear dynamics and check whether or not this mean max commute. The good news, though, is that when you solve this numerically, you can check whether or not the mean and max commute, right? So you cannot know a priori, but as you're solving the optimizations time over time, you can check for uh, for the mean and max to commute. 
so we can do numerical verification along the trajectory. Okay, so I want to now enter sort of the second part of the talk where I'm going to start talking about optimization algorithms. And I remind you that in this particular problem, being able to solve optimizations fast is very important because at every point in time, T, I have to either solve two optimizations, one moving horizon estimation and one model predictive control combined, combined one after the other, or I have to solve one of these min max optimizations, but I have to then redo this at every instant of time. And if you remember my first slide, if I'm doing this at 100 Hertz, and we've done this for things at 1000 Hertz, I have one, 10 milliseconds to do this. Um, a couple of things to think about this optimization. So there's when you when I write this, there's lots of variables here. There's parameters which will change from one optimization to the next. So the parameters are my past measurement. So when I solve my optimization at time t, I have to know a bunch of past measurements. Why? And I'm using uh, my past control input. So those are parameters. When I solve this at the next instant of time, the optimization will look pretty much the same, except that this will have different values, right? These things have been shifted. I have one more Y, I have one more U, and I'm throwing away some last one. But the optimization remains the same, except for these parameters. And then I have a bunch of optimization variables, because the parameters change, the optimization variables will obviously change. Uh, so the optimization parameters are the initial state, initial meaning at the beginning of the interval, past disturbances, um, future disturbances, and future controls. The, the noise itself is actually not really an um, uh, optimization variable, because if you look at this equation, the noise is just the difference between y and g of x, so it's not really an optimization variable. So even though I wrote here eta of ns, really what I put is eta of uh, y minus g. So it's uh, an optimization variable that disappears. But I do have lots of optimization variables. Um, and for some of the problems that I've, uh, I've, well, the first one that I've shown you and some other ones I'm gonna show you in a little while, this could grow, it's surely hundreds of optimization variables, very often a thousand optimization variables. All right, so how do I go about solving this optimization variable or this optimization problems? And I'm going to focus on this min max because it's a more interesting one. Although many of the comments I'm going to make would also uh, arise if I was solving the min and max separately. But let's look at the min max. So if the min max community has this basic result called the min max theorem, that uh, min max commuting is equivalent to the existence of an optimal control the maximization variable and optimal values for the minimization variable such that that form the solution of two coupled optimizations specifically if i were to know what were the optimal initial state disturbance and noise is that maximizer variable now plug them into the criteria and i'll minimize now just over u the minimum would be at u star conversely if someone would give me the optimal U star, I could get all the state systems and noise by just maximizing over that. Now, at first you think, well, this is not a very useful way to do computations because it'd be great if someone would give me the X stars, this star and star, because then I could compute the U or vice versa, if someone give me the U star, then I compute the other ones, but no one gives me any. So how do I do this? And the answer is actually very simple. What you do is, instead of trying to solve one optimization and then the other, because you can, you solve them both at the same time. So if for now, uh, let's assume that there were no constraints here, everything was very simple. All I, was, all I wanted to do is solve some unconstrained optimizations. Well, the optimality condition, the first of the optimality condition for this optimization, for this con unconstrained optimization is, would be just that the derivative with respect to u is equal to zero. For this one, the condition is that the derivative with respect to the maximizers is equal to zero. So all I do is I don't try to get some guess of this and then get the other. No, I just put all the equations together. Now I have a, non, a system of nonlinear equations where all of them are unknowns. And I solve them both at the same time. 
For the constraint, actually, this doesn't really change that much. All you do if you have constraint is to con consider Lagrange multipliers, right? You just write down what now we call these KKT conditions for the two optimizations. And you don't try to solve one after the other, you just solve them both at the same time. Right? So you're going to have, because of the constraint, you're going to have some Lagrange multipliers, uh, but that's fine. Uh, just con the equations become a little bit more complicated. And what we're going to do, and it's a little bit of a preview, I'm going to come, come back to this for more detail, but I'm actually going to solve this joint set of equations in the interior point method. I'll come back to that. So that you have an idea for, this is another example. Uh, this is an example uh, control of some sort of flexible beam. It's an infinite dimensional system, but it has been uh, truncated to an eight dimensional system. So I kept basically the four uh, modes, the four dominant modes, which have the lowest frequencies. Um, I am doing uh, MPCMHE, this, I'm doing the forward horizon as five time steps, the backward horizon has also five time steps. And uh, for this problem, that would translate to about 100 optimization variable, uh, 30 inequality constraints. Inequality constraints came from the fact that I was putting a saturation on the torque that I apply at the base. Uh, 18 inequality constraints come from the dynamics, and I'll come back more to that. And these are the kind of times that one needs, right? So this is, okay, so the question now is how do we get times like this? Hundreds of optimization variables, a few milliseconds. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm coming back to this slide, and I've shown you this before. Um, what I have now here is, if you remember, I had told you that when you have um, to solve these two optimization as constraints, we have to write this Lagrange multiplier equations for this, this KKT. So that's what I'm going to try to do next, because I want to show you the structure of this optimization. So I consider you sort of, uh, so that I wouldn't, you see, there's too many arguments here. So I'm simplifying my life. I just imagine that there's a U and a D. This D really actually corresponds to X, D, and noise in the previous one. But I'm just imagining yeah, there's a control X and the disturbance D. Um, and I want to solve, let's go back here. You see there was a minimization maximization and that's what I tried to write here. So there's a minimization with respect to U, maximization with respect to D. And then I added here some constraints. So there's inequality constraints for one optimization, inequality constraints for another optimization. And remember that uh, you know the minimization over U, the inequality constraints could be, for example, saying that the norm of U is smaller than one. Uh, you could have different constraints on D those here. The equality constraints are going to be the, the dynamics themselves. And I'll come back to this. But anyway, uh, I have here two coupled uh, optimizations. I could get, write Lagrangians for this. So I take criteria and I have terms related to Lagrange multipliers. And then what you have here are all the uh, first order necessary conditions for optimality. You have the, the gradient of the Lagrangian. So this one's here on the left, correspond to this optimization. So I, I need the, the derivative with respect to the optimization variable, the Lagrangian to be equal to zero. My equality constraints must be satisfied. The inequality constraints must be satisfied. And they have the complementary slackness condition that says that, well, for every constraint, either the lambda is zero or the constraint is satisfied, okay? Uh, I have two of these. By the way, I use this novel thing to denote derivatives. And uh, what I need to do then is to basically solve all these equations at the same time. But as I said a moment ago, I'm actually using what's called a, a primal dual interior point method. So let me just go to that. Maybe many of you know what it means. So all I did here is I wrote all the equations that I had before, sort of the equality constraints in red, the inequality constraints in blue. And the primal do interior point method does the following. First, it regards both the primal and the dual variables as, as variables to be found. So you look at this, this is a system of equations and the unknowns are both primal and dual variables. That's one item. Uh, 
and then it's an interior point because it's going to be it's going to be an iterative, iterative method. Typically, I'm going to use Newton steps to solve the equality constraints. But what I'm going to do is the when I look at the iterative method for the equality constraints and mostly ignore the inequality constraints, except that if my method tells me go in this direction and to this point, I'll show you in a moment this, I will not go if that ever violates the inequality constraints. So I start with the inequality constraints being satisfied. And then as I progress, I'll never go further uh, than what the inequality constraints uh, allow me to do. Okay? So that's why it's called interior point. You always stay with the inequality constraints satisfied. The equality constraints may not be satisfied. That doesn't matter. But I will never allow my iterative method to step out of the feasibility region for the inequality constraints. And there's, there's a little, a few tricks you have to do this here for this to work, but I'm not going to worry too much about that. Okay, so now let me talk about the Newton method. Okay, so Newton method is um, an iterative algorithm solve a system of uh, um, equations. And remember, I'm going to apply my Newton's method to the equality constraints. So all I have to solve is equality constraints. So I have to, I put here sort of in, uh, for now I put this generically, I want to make some f of x equal to zero. If I go to the previous slide, this capital F hides a lot of equations, right? It's all these equations were being were hidden inside that capital F. And this x is all the variables you want to solve. So this x now is going to be the u, the d, lambda u, mu, uh, u, lambda d, mu v, all the primal and dual variables. So it's a big vector. And a new iteration saying that you start with some initial x and then you uh, move along what's called the Newton direction. So you, from x, you go alpha plus delta x, delta x the Newton direction. In pure Newton method, you actually alpha is equal to one. So you just go exactly to where it says. And the Newton direction is obtained by solving a system of linear equations. And this method came from the, um, the idea behind this method is that if this function was linear, this would be, this would go in one step to the destination. If it's non-linear, well, it's basically what you need to matter is there's a local approximation and steps to where that local approximation would have a zero. You get there, if you got a zero, great. If you don't, another local approximation and keep going. Okay, <clears throat> so the key complication or the key reason that why Newton method um, is computationally intensive is because at every step of the Newton method, you have to solve a system of linear equations. And this system of linear equations uh, is going to give you this delta x, and delta x is the number of variables you're trying to estimate or that you're trying to solve. So if I go here, that n is a big, that x is a big vector that has all the primal variables, all the dual variables. All the do sorry, all the primal for one player, all the primal for the other player, all the duals for one player, and all the duals for the other player. So, if you remember some slides ago, that says, well, there's 100 optimization variables, 80 constraints. If this, well, I think I have it still here. 103 optimization variables, three inequality constraints, 80 equality constraints. All that adds up. That vector is going to have all these together. So, you know, it's over 200. So the matrix, this is a 200 vector. The matrix that you have is a matrix that's 200 by 200. And in fact, I can tell you that in the problems, those examples are a little old. We now solve problems with several thousand. So this matrix that you see here is a matrix that typically has a million elements. It's a thousand by a thousand or 3000 by 3000 matrix, okay? The big complication is to solve this system of linear equations. Now, at this point, we need to go and look like what is inside this matrix, because actually the point that I want to make is that even though this matrix has a million elements, in practice, they're mostly zeros for MPC problems. Okay, so why is that? So 
uh, if you so this matrix is going to have derivatives with respect to the variables of the function you want to solve. These functions were this, which themselves already have derivatives. So I'm going to spare you the old derivations. But this is what that matrix looks like for our problem. And the part that I want to highlight here is that a lot of the entries, most of them, are second derivatives. So the way to read this, this would be, for example, second derivative with respect to u and respect to z. I forgot to write z here. z actually is u and d together. All these top rows are second derivatives, every single one of them. And then you have here some derivatives of the equality and the inequality constraints. And you have some zeros. And then this is a diagonal matrix. What saves us here is that if you choose your variables carefully in MPC, MHE problems, most of the second derivatives are zero. That's what's really saving us. If they weren't, we'd be in big problems because you have a system of linear equations here. The size, this n that I have here, is on the order of hundreds or thousands. And in the worst case, solving a system of linear equations scales with a cube of the number of variables. And if that was the case, in fact, you could show that the method which with the, the, the time it takes to solve uh, the system would scale with the cube of the horizon length. We're going to see that actually it's going to scale linearly with the horizon length for us. So the reduction from cube to linear, which is quite spectacular, and it's what allows us to do this. OK, so I, I'm going to show you that just with an example. In fact, it's a very simple example just from MPC. Imagine that all I want to do is this. I have a quadratic cost. I, I put just to be a little bit interesting, put in some uh, inequality constraint, linear, linear inequality constraints here. There's a fixed initial condition. And the dynamics are extremely simple. It's just an integrator. Xk plus 1 is xk plus uk. I, I did this just to be very simple to solve. But actually, if you think about this, everything I'm going to say would be true for an absolutely non-linear system of any dimension. There's two ways to solve this problem. One, perhaps the one that would seem better, is, OK, so I know the dynamics. I know my initial condition, just an integrator. I could explicitly write the solution for the system. It's an integrator, just initial state plus the sum. And then I go, I have my criteria, and I put the state there. And this is my criteria. So I've uh, it's exactly what I'd expect is a function of my input u. I have to minimize this and they have some constraints. If I went back and tried to solve this using interior point method and keep track of the size of that matrix that I talked about before, you see that way it works the following. You have n is the length of my horizon here. I have n optimization variables. This was scalar. So it's all the use from u1 to un. So those are the numbers, these are the primal optimization variables. And I have uh, constraints on u. Basically, I'm saying that u has to be smaller than 1 and larger than minus 1. So I'm going to have 2n inequality constraints. Now, the primal dual method tries to solve everything. So it's going to construct a matrix, which is 3n by 3n. That's what the new matrix looks like. So it's uh, 9 times n squared. And if you were to compute that matrix, all those second derivatives that you've seen here, they're basically all non-zero. I wouldn't say they are all non-zero. There's, a, there's, there, well, actually, there's, I think, uh, all, all the ones here are all non-zero, and these some are zero, some are not. Um, nevertheless, the number of non-zero entries scales with n squared. Meaning, if I double my horizon, the number of non-zero entries is multiplied by 4. And you can see here, you know, if I try derivative with respect to first u1 and then u2, this term here makes that derivative be non-zero. Now, imagine that instead of doing that, I just say, I want to regard this as an optimization on the variables both u and x. Both of these are optimization variables. Except that I have a bunch of constraints on x. At first, it seems like a bad idea. 
because in fact, I used to have only the use as optimization variables. Now I have both the use and the axis. So the number of optimization variables that used to be n now grew to 2n. And I've also added equality constraints because I have now all this as equality constraints. So now I have that I didn't used to have any equality constraints. Now I have any equality constraints. And I still have my original 2n inequality constraints just came from here. So now my Newton matrix, it used to be nine times n squared in size in terms of total number of entries. Now it's 25 n squared. However, the number of non-zero entries now is just linear on n. And the difference is, if I now take, for example, j here, and I ask you, first take derivative with respect to u1, let's say, one of my observation is, and then for what you get, take derivative with respect to u2. That's zero. Or if I ask you, cross derivatives, first take the derivative with respect to x1, and then with respect to u1. They're all zero. The only non-zero derivatives that you have out of J, second order derivatives, are second derivative with respect to U1, U1, or U or uh, X1, X1. All cross derivatives across different times in U, across different times in X, and from X and U, they're all zero. And so the matrix is much larger, but the number of non-zero entries is much, much smaller. And that really is what matters to figure out that what matters to solve the system of nonlinear equations. So I have here just some statistics. So what I have here is I have the two versions of the points, exactly the same problem, same solution. It's a very simple convex problem. Um, you, so let's see what I have here. So on the X axis, sorry, on the, so on the, sorry, on the Y axis on the left, so in blue, I have the solve time of my solver using one of the senior point math solver and the number of Newton iterations, which is turns out not to matter too much, but maybe I'll make a comment about that. And what I've done is I solve several versions of this problem for ver different sizes of n, you know, maybe starting with n just 10 all the way to n 100. When you use this option one and you look at solve times, that's this curve here. For small problems, it's a smaller, it works better. The solve time is smaller. So it's a, this is a millisecond, this is 100 milliseconds. So, you know, it's maybe um, 10, 10 microseconds. Uh, but as you increase N, this here is scaling much worse. In fact, it's scaling to 3.3. It's not really 3.3, this is just a fit. Uh, whereas when you solve it this way, it starts worse because there's more variables, but it scales linearly. So very rapidly, even for just an horizon of 100, it's already a big difference. These are log scales, so this is a huge difference, right? This is 10 times, basically 10 times faster. Interestingly enough, uh, even though the problem is a very different number of variables, the number of iterations remains almost the same, and this is very common for interior point methods. Uh, you increase the size of the problem, the number of Newton iterations doesn't increase, it's all, the reason why I see this being increased is computing the Newton step. If you think a little bit about this problem, I've presented you a very simple problem with linear dynamics and these things are just quadratic, but the argument for this to be sparse has nothing to do with linearity or not. If here you'd have xk plus one equals sine of xk plus uk, and this thing would have sines and cosines. It would, the argument, if this was sine of xk squared plus arctangent of uk squared, the argument would still be the same. It's all about the cross terms not existing. And that is nothing to do with linearity. Linearity makes it easy for us to see and to compute derivatives. But the sparsity is also true for nonlinear systems. And in fact, you can show that in general, if I put everything nonlinear here, and this instead of a scalar system would be a vector system, the number of non-zero entries still scales linear. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, I have to tell you a few things. So um, when you start solving these things, it's a little bit um, it's at least intimidating because there's lots of, this is, Remember, this is a matrix could be a thousand by a thousand, and all of them has all these derivatives. Um, 
it turns out that uh, there's been lots of progress in this area. And in fact, uh, there's a few options to do this. Um, we, we have our own tool, something called TenseCalc that you can play around with. It's a MATLAB toolbox. It saw, it's, it's somewhat inspired by CVX, it tries to use some MATLAB-like language. It does all the symbolic differentiation for you. It actually does not do automatic differentiation, the symbolic differentiation small uh, difference. Um, one interesting thing is that as opposed to many of the other tools, it produces C code for that particular problem. It's often called, uh, it produces dedicated solvers. And the reason why it makes sense for MPC is that when you solve the MPC problem, you're basically always solving exactly the same optimization, just changing a few parameters. So you can get tremendous efficiency to actually, instead of using a general purpose solver like IPOPT or, or, or something like that, if you actually get a piece of code that generates C code that just works for that uh, particular optimization. Lots of stuff become possible. For example, all the um, memory allocation, all that can be uh, directly embedded into the code. And so um, if you want to do very fast, code, uh, you have to do this. Just for you to have an idea, this is what this problem would look like. Um, so we would define some optimization variables. In this case, uh, we are, of course, using the, the optimization. One is uh, u, the other is x. There's a criteria that looks at the uh, norm square of x and u. These are vectors. Um, and they put constraints, u smaller than 1, u larger than minus 1. We put inequality constraints. We more or less standard MATLAB uh, syntax. And then we just do a, system, a call to a function. And this function actually doesn't solve the optimization. This function just writes a piece of C code in, in your computer, which then you, you call. You can call from within MATLAB uh, to solve the optimization. And of course, you do this once. So then if you're doing MPC, you don't regenerate the code. You now you have the code that you call as many times as you want every few milliseconds. So, this is the, the example I've seen you before. This, I, I had shown you this type of numbers for a linear example. This is for the, um, the example I was showing in the beginning. It, it doesn't, this actually is a little bit, a little bigger in terms of number of variables and it turns out to be faster. Um, in this one is a variation of that one, but we, we added a disturbance. Um, that's the wind. But now you see this all fits in the framework that I've shown you before where uh, in this case, actually disturbance is the evader trying to move away in the wind. All that is solved through this min-max problem. So the, the minimization is finding the trajectory for the pursuer and the evader is solving an, uh, a maximization, in this case, really trying to evade. In this simulation, in the beginning, you actually were not making the evader move away. The evader was actually forcing it in a straight line. And at some point here, we turned on and we actually got the evader to use the solution coming from the min-max optimization. So here now, the evader is trying to, to run away. Okay, I am done. Um, I have just the outline of the talk. And I'm particularly excited. I think it's very interesting, this idea of using online optimization for uh, control problems. Control problems that I showed you, and I think that was an, another message to get out of this talk is that they have particular structures, the optimization particular structures that enable us to solve really uh, fa relatively large optimizations uh, very fast. Um, always talking about solve times of milliseconds and often below that on the microseconds. Uh, what are we doing on this? So the stability conditions for nonlinear systems, I, I told you about before, we can verify them numerically, uh, but it's not very well understood, to be honest, more theoretically what they mean. Um, we have been continuing to work on these optimizations and trying to allow our methods to uh, solve larger and larger optimizations, always still trying to use second order methods to explore better um, the sparsity, although there are challenges. And I should tell you right now that, for example, in many applications in machine learning, uh, things don't scale as nicely. It depends. If you want to solve some support vector machine problem or um, 
maybe some um, lasso, you know, robust. If the number of variables is on the order of a thousand, you can do it. But if you start having very, very large training sets, the methods I told you about today don't work very well. And we're also pretty interested in solving stochastic optimization problems when you actually take into account uh, not necessarily adversarial disturbances in the method we've done here, adversarial with penalties on um, with penalties on the likelihood, but really stochastic optimizations where you put distributions and you want to minimize expected values. Those are tough problems. Um, but the question is how to try to use optimization-based techniques rather than relying on Monte Carlo-based techniques, stochastic gradient descent and things like that because you can do much faster. All right, so this is enough. Thank you. Thanks for that uh, great talk. So I think we have time for maybe like one or two questions because we're a little bit over, but um, I'd like to open it up to folks if uh, anyone has questions for the speaker. Yeah, I apologize uh, about the time. I, I should have had my phone here and I kept it in my pocket. Oh no, I think it's all right. So, um, yeah, if no, if no one has a question, I have a question. It's a little bit more high level, I guess. Um, so we just had Tamir Bashar speak uh, about his work on policy optimization in LQ games and these sort of mixed H two H infinity problems. Um, and so I think having you speak right after is is kind of complimentary. Um, and so I'm wondering uh, what your thoughts are on sort of this MPC plus MHE approach versus like some RL uh, black or black box type approach. And in particular, it seems that, you know, there are clear differences, um, not just at the philosophical level, but even sort of the appropriateness for each of these methods based on context. And so I'm, you know, there, I've noticed there's a recent trend of introducing model-based approaches in RL. And so I'm wondering if you see any opportunities in the context of uh, some of the applications that you're considering, in particular, where there's like a lot of constraints or real-time considerations. Um, yeah, do you see some opportunities yeah. for like sort of blending these approaches? I, well, let me actually, uh, there, is, there is a problem with MPC. Mm. There is a problem with MPC. If I, let me just pick some optimization here. So, so take this one. Mm -hmm. um, so we do this optimization and we solve for the horizon. I, I look at my state now and I figure out what I'm going to do for the, for the future. And if there's no disturbance is nothing, you know, uh, this is perfect. What I'm going to, I know exactly what I'm going to get. I may decide to then do receding horizon or not. Mm -hmm. Now, if I have disturbances or noise, I know for sure that my predictions are not going to be correct. Mm -hmm. And then typically what I do is, let's say what I was proposing here is, well, let's assume the worst case disturbances and protect ourselves against that. But this type of policies do not consider the fact that I am going to re-optimize this in the future and take advantage of information that I'm going to get. It, I, so I, I need to put, maybe I need to put this one here. Actually, in all of them though, you optimize, but you would not, if I told you, okay, you optimize, but at three instances of time from now, you'll get a great measurement of X. I don't know what it is, but you'll get a great measurement of X. There's no way to put that here. There's nothing here that allows me to take into account that I'm going to get a, a good measurement. That's very different from optimizing a policy mm -hmm. because a policy is a map for measurements to control. Mm -hmm. And if you are doing something, let's say like dynamic programming, Dynamic programming does take into account, if done properly, that I will get information into the future. Mm -hmm. So 
by the way, if you have linear systems quadratic cross section, nothing of that matters <laughs> because it's in the end, uh, there's enough structure that, you know, when you solve an H2 problem, you know that there's separation principle says, you know, uh, it, yeah. just do best estimation and best control on that. So for linear problems, this actually doesn't matter. And that's why it's generally ignored. Mm -hmm. But for nonlinear problems, there's a big difference between estimating a policy and estimating and doing planning for the future without taking into account. The problem though, is that these are already relatively complicated problems, right? You know, I'm computing, I have to compute uh, variables over uh, a large horizon, etc. But still, it's a finite dimensional problem. I'm doing things out optimizing a sequence of views. Mm -hmm. Optimizing policies are much worse problems because that's an infinite dimensional space. Mm -hmm. So it can give me a huge advantage, but in general, it scales terribly with the size of the space because this, or, or film measurements in general, because it scales typically exponentially with the dimension. This problem scale linearly with dimension. It's a huge difference. Yeah, yeah. But that's that's the key thing. That's a big problem. Uh, optimizing over policies can, in principle, give you much better or or somewhat better performance. Yeah, I see. It depends, but but it's computationally so bad that. Yeah. So there's some key trade offs there, I guess. Yeah. Exactly. But it is. It is possible, especially if one is allowed, is this possible to come up with problems where this type of planning performs terribly? Mm. That they're, you have to work hard to <laughs> get something a little bit contrived. Mm. But it is possible to come up with problems where there's a big difference between estimating, do this kind of planning and estimating policies. Mm. Interesting. Uh, mm. Okay. Anyway, that, that's. Um, that's a long standing, it's not even philosophical yet. It's, it's yeah. a very important thing. I'm solving the easy problem. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, is there any other questions from the audience? Otherwise, I think we'll wrap up since we're a bit over here. Okay. Um, so All thanks right. again for speaking. It was a All right. Wonderful thanks, Lillian. Thanks yeah. for inviting me. It was great. Yeah. All right. Bye. See you guys.